you. Why does it matter? Why is it, what is it, first of all, science communication? Let's you know, put something simple on that. Um, but why does it matter and, and what is it and what should we do? Okay, oh, thanks, Sally. Is that on? Okay. Um, so for me, uh, science communication is literally just telling your story of science and why it's important. And it's, it's as simple as that. And it's not done well um, or it's kind of ignored because communication isn't seen as as serious as the research. And we forget at the end of the day so much money and time is put into investing in science that we forget that there's a whole lot of people, a bunch of people out there who actually are really curious about science and discovery. So for me, it's around engaging people with what you're doing and, and why and explaining it um, in a very simple way. So I've been a publisher for many, many years. And one of the things that I notice here, and it's, it's a lot here, but it's global, is that we underestimate people's interest in science. Um, if you look at the media, it's all arts, business and law graduates who run media companies. I come from a business background. Um, and they didn't like science at school. Often that's what I've heard over the years. So there's, uh, when you do surveys in newspapers, people say they want to read more about science, but it's always politics at the top. So it's a reflection of what the media owners want to talk about rather than a reflection of what people are interested in. And uh, when they talk about science, people put physics near the top um, of what they're interested in. If you're a science publisher, you know you put a physics story on the front cover, it's going to sell. Yeah. But I think it's really interesting, that reflection um, about a publisher's perspective and why we have had politics at the, the top and the headline news for so long. In the last two years in the global pandemic, there's never been more interest in science. There's never been more interest in a hope for a cure. Is it here? Is it coming? Have we got it yet? Are we, are we, are we taking a jab? Are we not taking a jab? What are the risks? What are the rewards? You know, all of that is actually put it front and centre again, which is really interesting. I think, Phil, you know, as an investor, and as somebody who gets pitched a lot of stories, you know, every day, or pitched a lot of science from people, um, give us your lens and your perspective on it because I do think um, it's a particular art as well as a science in itself, the communication. Yeah, um, and I would also just like to say it is brilliant coming out and thanks to everybody that battled the rain. I nearly forgot to put my pants on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I am a very strong believer in the story and the communication being as important as the science itself, literally equal. So if you've invented infinite power or quantum computers or uh, food that has a zero carbon footprint, it doesn't matter if nobody knows about it and no one helps you and no one supports you. Uh, I often say to the families that we're working with, who is telling your story on your behalf and how you know it, right? Because I know, I, in my world, what I hear is people telling each other about other people's ideas, right? And so you need to be armed to be able to do that if you're, if you're one of those people. And so uh, the problem that happens is some of the best scientists in the world are the worst communicators. And ironically, it's precisely because of how scientists are trained, in my view. Because as a scientist operating under the scientific method, you know, we are trained to have a hypothesis, be very clear about what that hypothesis is, to then test for failure points that you know, could cause that hypothesis to be wrong. So we're thinking about lots of negative things, we're thinking about lots of risks, and we're very, very cautious about talking about what could be. We're going to constrain our thinking to describing what we have proven or what we think we're just about to prove. That tends to lead to something investors don't want to invest in, because you basically said, here, you know, my, the scope of my ambition is small. I have a whole bunch of concerns about risks that could happen here. Um, and it sort of 
it's it's a different kind of communication which actually doesn't help people come behind your opportunity. So quite often scientists feel uncomfortable first of all dumbing down that idea, making it sound so simplistic, and we may give some examples of this uh, as we go through the session, making it sound so simplistic that that they feel like their audience are going to listen to that and go, that's crazy, that's stupid, that just sounds childish. Whereas actually that's what most people need to hear to actually understand what it is that you're, you're making, right? And then actually have some ambition about what you think could be possible in the next six, 10 years to keep going down this path um, and help people understand that because it's the journey that people want to come on with you and they want to go on that. 10 year journey, they don't want to feel like they're going to come in and support you and the whole thing's going to collapse in six months. So I'm going to pick up on, on a couple of things that you've said there. One, I'm actually going to, I'm going to challenge all the scientists in the room that think that communicating your science simply is dumbing something down. It's actually making it accessible to a broader population. And if you fail to do so, you're going to live in a very narrow bubble of people that you can talk to about what you do. So I, I want to reframe that as it's not dumbing down, it's making it accessible. And very much like we want events and activities and places that we live in and communicate and walk through to be accessible to all people of all abilities, how do we actually make our ideas more accessible? And I think if we reframe that, it actually becomes a really good selling point about why it matters. Now I want to dig into a little bit about some some you know some some what great what can be the impact of great science and communication and what can be you know the, the, the downfall if we don't get it right. And you know I want to I want to give an example of just actually what happened before. Phil referenced this about making someone your champion and your cheerleader. You know, that's what my challenge with our resident companies is help me tell what you do and the amazing work and impact of it so I can actually make a connection. Um, and not only that, when I've got residents that are raising capital and I introduce you to somebody that happens to work for this somebody, um, get them excited so they go back and talk to their team about it. You know, when you do it well, it's actually transformative. I'd love to pick out some, you know, just from, from your perspectives and either one of you to kick it off, you know, what's some great examples, what's some abysmal examples and what's the impact of it? Um, well, okay, I talk about this a lot. It's a great example of communication and if you think about, you might be in the health industry and you've heard about Mayo Clinic many, many, many times. But from a public um, point of view, from a general public point of view, no one really knew who the Mayo Clinic was until the last few years. And that's because they communicate, they answer questions around what people have around health. So if you look up a, a health issue right now, you're going to end up on the Mayo Clinic website. And that's incredibly powerful because you're getting, their brand has gone global in just a few short years. You trust them and it builds a sense of not necessarily community, but all of a sudden everyone knows who they are. It's not something I ever see. I talk about it all the time. So if you've got a particular topic that you want to know about, where do you go for information if it's artificial intelligence, med tech? Where are you ending up? But for the Mayo Clinic, they've made it, they've made it really, really clear about what they do and why. It's not beautiful, um, but it's something that's reached globally. So you could even take that down to something that's much more niche and say, kids' health or a particular topic, you drill down on that, you still up, end up on the Mayo Clinic website. And my challenge always to scientists and unis and research institutes and STEM organisations is, uh, is where are people going for your information, or for information about your topic? And you learn a lot from that because I think you mentioned something, we're outsourcing our messaging all the time to other people. Other people are telling our stories. So what are the questions and answers? And I think Mayo Clinic does that absolutely beautifully. That's a big, good example. So have you got any top of mind examples of great sort of public communication around science and engineering? I, I do. And I'd also just like to open up with 
the frame about what communication is, because I think one of the mistakes we can make is think it's all about you know, what's it going to say in the Fin Review or mm. the New York Times about us, but sometimes it can be what does it say on your jobs page? Yeah. yeah. What do people understand about your company when they look at what jobs are available and how they're described and what your culture is like? Um, one of the things we do in our firm, for example, is we discovered last year that some of the big private equity firms in the world are literally investing with data. So they've got a big consulting firm like Bain actually collecting all this information and then they literally tell these private equity firms like Tiger Global, here are the companies you should invest in and then they go and invest. We realise that communication wise, what do we look like? What do our portfolio companies look like when you go and look at the data and you just look at one of these databases and that makes sure everything is just beautifully communicated in there with all the best versions of the numbers that the companies have so that they're properly standing out. You know, every bit of information you put out there is a beacon for somebody else to see your light and come towards you and ask them and offer to help you. Right? If you're quiet, if you're in stealth mode, which is the thing I hate the most in everything that I do in my work, you are making everything in your life a thousand times harder, infinity harder, because no one knows to help you. They don't even know that you exist. They don't even know it's a thing. And actually, the amazing thing about what scientists do is you are, by definition, inventing something that no one's ever heard of before. It doesn't exist. They're not thinking about you because it's not a thing. They haven't heard of you yet. So you've got to kind of put it out there. I have got an example. Okay. Um, I just so, want to say, I want to mention that it's, yeah. it's uh, communication is often taking the randomness out of people finding you because right now, for most people, it's very random and you've got to make it deliberate. Yeah, that's mm. right. Put it like this. Expand the surface area. Just put yeah. lots of conversations out there and let people come to you. But in terms of your amazing comment earlier about not dumbing it down, actually making mm -hmm. it accessible. Uh, so this is one of my favourite companies in the world that I think are massively impactful, and, um, and I'm going to describe how they describe themselves. I'm going to read how they describe themselves when I first met them. So naturopathy to address livestock methane. The red microalga asparagopsis delivers abatement of ruminant methane at low dose with potential to cut agriculture emissions and improve ruminant productivity. So who's excited? Shut up and take my money. Yeah. Not. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the scientist, when I first, I'm not a scientist. When I first read this, I literally had to spend the whole afternoon trying to figure out what it was. And we all know, I, th well, I think many people now know about Future Feed, right, and what they're actually doing. But that's because they're much better now at their language that they use. And also, the media has shown them how to describe themselves. Yeah, the media talks about low emission cattle climate friendly steaks, you know, they talk about seaweed that stops cows burping, that has a climate benefit. So these are, this has opened it up to people and got everyone quite excited. And at my earlier point, before that was properly communicated, no one knew cows were even a thing with climate change. No, no, you, can't, you can't, couldn't go to a, a barbecue with your friends in the suburbs and say, what is the impact on climate from cows? And people would go, well, it's massive. I know cows are terrible. I don't think, I think many people don't even know. And so there's a whole communication job to do there. And the language I read, Thanks. most people in the world won't know what the heck that, that's all about. So I, I want to dig into this a bit more because I think this is a really powerful concept, right? It's the concept of impact. It's the so what, right? If we talk about why your why and why science communication matters, it matters to have an impact, but so what, what does that look like? And I think, you know, um, for me, if I, if I think about that example, my parents owned a fruit and veggie shop, they come from an agricultural sort of background, they didn't finish, you know, high school, actually no one in my family did till I did. 
the way I describe that to my dad is like, Dad, this is really good stuff that they feed cows that make them fart less and the meat's better. And he'd be like, great, can I have one? You know, that's, that's literally how simple it is. When I think about impactful message, and I want you to kind of, let's talk about the impact and the potential impact and some examples of impact. Um, one that resonates with me, and you probably don't even think about this as powerful science communication. What do these three words mean to you? Slip, slop, slap. Yeah. Right. All right, it's one of these incredible campaigns in Australia. Slip on a shirt, slop on sunscreen, slap on a hat. Um, and, and really what that's about is we have one of the highest incidence of skin cancer in the world. But if I tell you all of the data, so what? What does that mean? What do I do? What's the action you want me to take? So let's talk about, you know, give me some examples, give me unpack impact. How do we, how do we um, you know, see that tangible impact that happens in businesses, in universities, or wherever, does it happen? Or is it all like, don't look up and actually we let the world end? Okay, you want an example of something powerful? In, yeah, something powerful. So when some, somebody's turned their science communication on, and what has that delivered to them? What has been the impact of that and getting it right? Okay, so the Queensland Brain Institute um, at University of Queensland a few years ago had a breakthrough with an ultrasound that broke down the plaque in the um, brain of mice and removed the plaque, which basically restored memory in dementia-ridden dementia um, mice. I'm probably, like, if there was a researcher, he'd, he'd be horrified how I just described that. So a really powerful breakthrough. Now, that came out in 2015. The story was, oh, maybe it was 2013. It was around then. It was the 15th most shared story that year globally. But nothing on the Queensland Brain Institute site had a story. They just had their press release. They just had the press release. So I'll t this is an example of a piece of work I've done. So they said, well, how do we change that? So I said, right, well, let's have some content around the brain. So we developed a whole strategy around, you know, around concussion, around dementia, around learning and memory. And instead of just having communicators in the team who just did everything, because so often we just go, okay, we're going to employ a communicator and it's a sort of catch-all for about five different jobs. They employed serious journalists and developed, we developed a whole series around the brain. So the first one was concussion and then dementia and they're still doing it years later. I'm not involved with it now. Now that directly led, I spoke to the head of philanthropy because you don't do these things in isolation, right? You've got to do it with your head of philanthropy, your head of communications, and it's got to be something that everyone, including the director, is behind because comms can't be just done on the side. But that brought in around 30 million for dementia um, about three years after it was launched because it built that trust. Uh, and that's the type of thing you never see happen at universities or research institutes because um, communications is sort of an afterthought. It's not embedded in business development. It's seen as a cost, not a revenue tool. And if you're a publisher, you're producing content because you want to build audience and you want to sell ads or subscriptions. And you have to do that shift with content and strategy and communication and be really um, focused and say, well, we're just going to do this. Um, can I mention the, one more example? Yeah. Okay, so then you all know about the World Economic Forum. So around four years ago, they were only known for Davos. Um, okay, a lot of people knew about that, but they didn't have connection with people. So they decided, right, we want to be known globally um, for stuff that's important to humans, like, you know, what, what's important to society. And they wanted to make it incredibly positive because there's a lot of negativity, you know, a lot of negative news, but they wanted to profile not stuff that they were necessarily doing, but shine a light on really brilliant stories out there. Still tackle problems, but talk about the solutions. So they employed a bunch of BBC um, journalists who had all this video experience, so 10 people in total, 
they didn't use their own, um, they didn't go and create their own imagery or anything like that. They just sucked up imagery from other people and they created these really short um, videos. And for sure, if you're on social media, you'll have seen them, you'll have shared them. The branding's consistent, There's uh, the tone's consistent and they get over a billion views a year from that and that's just come from, from nowhere to that and that's 10 people. And a lot of organisations that I talk to, like really big organisations like universities, often have 200 communicators, but they have no audience. And if you embed that, who's our audience, right at the beginning, who do we want to influence in how you do all you communicate? Yeah, who do we want to influence and talk to? And stop thinking of content as a cost, but as part of your business development, it's a whole shift. This, um, the, the people that will help you, 90% um, of them are going to directly help you and they'll be around it. And so I'll give you an example. We have a company called MGA Thermal. Does anyone know yep. that? Um, their technology is basically uh, an advanced material that holds heat for a phenomenal amount of time. And, um, and they probably spent about six months to a year sort of trying to tell us why that's amazing as a sort of energy storage solution for a new energy system. And, you know, energy companies really fall parallel here. They're really complicated to describe. They really get lost in the weeds of the technicality. And then they started telling a story um, about how it could be used to transition coal-fired power stations to renewable power stations. So you actually use exactly the same infrastructure and you pull out the coal furnace and you put in their new technology and you feed in the renewables. And lo and behold, these horrible uh, emissions producing infrastructure uh, factories and plants that people don't want to shut, people can't shut down, right, because they've spent all this money that they need to get a return on investment for. All of a sudden you can you can transform it, you just switch out one of the components and all of a sudden it's renewable. And inbound offers just came from all over the world to that, to that company, from all the energy companies who are all sitting on billions of dollars of infrastructure. So they, the right hook was kind of put out there, it's that beacon that I was talking about before, and then the world came to them and now it's pulling their products out of them, they're not trying to understand what it is and how it works. I love that and I want to unpack that a little bit further because I think one of the couple of things that, that you both said, and not, ex not explicitly, but I, I think it's worth pulling out, is the types of people that are responsible for this communication and it's not the person sitting over there that's ta necessarily solely tasked with it. There is a role for others in the organisation and in this case I'm assuming the founders in particular and the scientists involved to do it. Um, love to kind of unpack the impact piece and Kylie, you mentioned it earlier about trust. Trust is a, an important thing in actually delivering that impact. So we can communicate, we can get a great message, but actually balancing that with trust, and I think this goes back a little bit, Phil, to, to some of your opening comments about where sometimes we get it wrong as scientists because we, we want to paint a picture, but we actually want to paint it very, very truthfully and tell you every single possible risk of everything that could go wrong. And so suddenly we kind of lose the hopeful opportunity of what the science could lead to um, because we're kind of caught in the narrative of, of the, all the failures that are going to take before we get to that successful point. What are your thoughts about how we how we weave those two things together? Because I think trust is a really interesting one in communication and it's what does actually get people buy-in. How do we how do we navigate that and how do you think about that in, in helping, you know, it might start with you, Phil, in, in helping people communicate their idea effectively. Because you are in a very trusting sort of relationship, right? You need to trust that their science works. Yes, you do due diligence and things like that, but you, they're asking for lots of money. Yeah, I mean, it's about timing and framing more than it is about what you say specifically. 
So of course, you know, we all need to know the risks at the right time. We need to because we need to understand what is the work that we're going to do to navigate our way through those things and get there. You know, as an entrepreneur, fundamentally. I was horrified when I came into the scientific world. I don't know how you guys do it, frankly, because I remember going to my first sort of seminar where someone presented a paper of their research, and they were they were one sentence into their presentation, and the hand went up in the crowd, and they were interrogated on that data point that they put out right at the beginning, so, and the conversation just got stuck into that interrogation. And I can see how scientists think the pitch is going to be like that. But actually, the, the pitch is like that cliche we hear all the time about job interviews and things like it. You see these to get the interview, right? And then when you're in the interview, you do the next one. And then when you're in the next round of interviews, you do the next one. You're going deeper and deeper and deeper. But our first job is to get people to step in. Mm -hmm. And we have to do that then at that time. It's, it's never about being dishonest and this is a conversation I have all the time so I'm always talking to people about the story and you know getting people excited and people say well is that is that the ethical thing to do you know and it's like well no, you're, you're hearing me say I want you to lie and that's not what I'm saying I'm mm -hmm. saying I want you to get people excited and let them know what could be what's possible right at the right time and I'll ask you will walk me through the risks and what's the journey we're going to go on together and you go through that journey and you absolutely walk them through the what all the issues are there and together you'll figure out figure what they are. I'll, I'll tell you the story actually about this. So when I, I ran at one stage in my life the CSIRO's National Accelerator Program for Scientists. This is where I sort of discovered a lot of this stuff. And one day one of the sessions was me presenting to the cohort Elon Musk launching the power wall. Did, any, did anyone here see that that presentation? Yeah. It's it's really good. And the reason I chose to show it was is because Elon Musk is a bit of a dad. Right? He's not he's not you know, he's not Steve Jobs. Uh, he's you know, he's sort of a bit clumsy and he's he's nerdy and he just tells you the science, right? And he doesn't, you know very particular way and this this particular um, this particular presentation he begins with today we're going to talk about how energy flows across the earth right and then he starts walking through how energy the energy system works today and how we need to change it right and then at the end he talks about and here's what we're doing you know and he, he actually has the whole theater powered by the the Tesla batteries and you know turns the lights off and then the lights will come on again and they're powered by the batteries and that's his you know, aha moment, right? Um, and and anyway the, 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 the presentation finished and I looked up at the crowd to say how good was that, right? And everyone was really stone stone faced and really unexcited by it. And this is a room full of university um, researchers and CSIRO scientists uh, and then one scientist said to me well he's he's not telling the truth <laughs> you know well, who's this guy so like do you know what the, do you know what the calculation is to actually move <laughs> the energy system to its solar power so like it's not going to work it's just not possible that's why no one's doing it today and this whole sort of scientific takedown happened and I said, well, that's not what he did. What he's doing there is he's starting a movement and he's saying what part of it he's going to do. And he's opening the door for everybody else to come in. And to that extent, he was absolutely, and there was not a single lie or extension of the truth there. He was talking about a future which he thinks possible that he wanted everyone to go for. And people love that. Like, people will join your company. If they if they see the same future you see, they're excited by it. They want to follow you, but they're going to see the future. I love that example. Carla, do you want to pick up on anything around trust and truth telling? Yeah, trust for me starts with um, respecting and knowing the audience. And often we think they're out there, and we and we don't know who they are. But every time I talk to a researcher or scientist 
they always know their audiences because they're answering those questions all the time. And they're always, they can always tell you, these are the concerns, these are the queries that they've got. So it's really going back to that audience and saying, okay, maybe I don't know everything and maybe I should ask a few more questions. But usually that's, I think that respect for the audience is, is a huge thing, um, not obviously, Dumbing down is a, a bit of a problem because it's saying communications is, um, is uh, you know, something that's lower level as opposed to how we um, talk to each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but that's really where, for me, trust starts because it's all about who, who do you want to communicate and what do they need to know and, and why. Yeah, I love that. Um, there's a couple of things I think that you've both said to, to pull out of learnings and I just want to riff on the, my pet peeve is when we talk about communication as a soft skill. Yeah. If it's so soft, why aren't you all brilliant at it? So just saying, I actually think it's a hard skill and it's one that just like every other skill out there takes time, takes honing, takes practice, takes refinement takes a lot of work. It's not a soft skill at all. It's a much harder skill than people think about. But I, I love that idea. There's a couple of things that, that for me are, are key takeaways is understanding who you're communicating to yeah. and that audience and what they need to know yeah. for them. And they don't need to know, if they're not a physicist, they don't need to know all of your theoretical physics that goes behind your quantum computer or anything else or your actual you know calculations they need to know why does it matter to me um, and then I think Phil you know really kind of understanding taking people on the journey that journey narrative is such an important one and I think for the the people in the room tonight um, you know thinking about it if you're trying to do something really big and bold is it something that's close to market adoption right now or is it 10 years away? And if it's 10 years away, how do you how do you translate that to meet people, which is almost what you're both saying, knowing your audience and meeting them where they are. I want to I want to start making this really real. I see people with notepads out, which I love, right? It means we're here to learn, so there's a thirst to, to learn and to do more and to grow, and I want to learn. So let's unpack that. Let's make this really practical, because we've got two brilliant people here who are master communicators. Um, you know, I, I love, I've seen you both in action in many different formats, and I always go away and remember the stories that you tell and the, what the point they are that are illustrated them. Um, maybe Phil, I might start with you because you gave us an example of a company before with some really poor communication about their science. How did you take them on the journey? What are some of the tips and the tricks that you worked with them to actually get them to the point that they could be honest about farming burping cows and quality meat? Yeah, but, but there's lots of ways of do, lots of tools, but really they all come down to just communicating a lot with people. Um, and um, uh, I, I, you know, I talked to Sally and the team about a great. Um, there's a great YouTube series that actually has scientists having to describe a concept to people of different age groups, and they start off with kindergarten students. So it's something like quantum computing, right? And they start off describing how it works to kindergarten students, and then they go all the way up to a quantum postdoc and describe it to them. And that's the truth of which bit. And so you, you've got one, you can see what Harley was describing, you can see a scientist knowing their audience, and they're the people that have been describing it, and they just land it perfectly every time, and you know they have done that thousands of times and it was yeah. really bad at the beginning and they you know we've all done it right where you've told someone something and you can see their eyes go i don't know what you're saying right now or i'm not or i'm bored i'm going to check my watch and, <laughs> and you can also see the moment where people go that's interesting that's really interesting like tell me tell me more about that and they come in on it you go i found it i found the metaphor i found the simpler way of describing it um, and that's what we're looking for. And then there's a whole bunch of tools that just sort of help you do that. So we, you know, we take people on storytelling um, journeys um, where you know you have to turn it into a fairy tale, for example. You know, tell tell the story of your company from ten years from now and look back. Once upon a time, there was this guy, it was me, and came up with this idea. Then I did this, and then this happened, and then this happened. 
Um, sometimes called the Pixar pitch, right? Because every Pixar movie has got exactly the same pattern. And you just copy the Pixar pattern and you tell your own story. And then you make it come true, right? Um, then there's just simple things like the so what that Sally was talking about at the beginning. I mean, why? That's what. That's why the so called. Who's done a Gaddy pitch here? Yeah. <laughs> the startup people put their hands up. So the Gaddy pitch. There's some guy who I've never even met. I don't even know what else he's famous for, but his second name's Gaddy. Right? And he came up with this, this pattern for a pitch, which is it goes like this. You say, you know how. And when you finish that, you know, you know how this is problem in the world. Well, what we do is we solve the problem in this way. In fact, and you give them a slam dunk proof point or data point that makes them sort of really go, wow, that's amazing, right? And that's the so what. The, the in fact at the end is the is the so what, and you've got your really clear kind of pattern for how you describe it to somebody in a barbecue. 